Hello. Hello. Good morning, church. It's good. Very, very, very good to see you all this morning. Uh, my name is Mark Dominguez, as you all well and know. I'm going to go over our announcements this morning, and like I said, it is very good to see you all this morning. So our first announcement that we've got here is going to be our connection card. You've known, uh, hopefully you've known our connection card pretty thoroughly nowadays. Uh, please fill out that card. You can drop it into the plate either up here or in the back so we can connect with you and you can connect with us. Um, information about yourself or if you're having a change of information or want to get in contact with us in any way or for any reason, uh, please fill out that card. On the flip side of that card is the prayer card. And we would love for you to fill that out with a prayer need for yourself or, or any loved one or if you have an unspoken prayer you would love to fill out, that would be the place for that. And it, again, you can just drop it off in either of those plates. So our next one here, download our church app. So that's our hub for all communication going forward. Um, the prayer card is, uh, and the connection card is perfectly fine. However, the church app is the hub for any events and any other things that we want to communicate to you. Uh, please download that church app with the notifications on and we can communicate to you, send out notifications and send out any updates about what's happening here at South Peoria and we would love for you to get involved in that way. So please download that app or we can help you with that if you need. So we've got Pray for America. We're still praying for America because we all know that America needs Jesus. And uh, if you've grabbed one of those wristbands, the red wristbands or the pamphlets, um, we're still praying for America every day. America needs Jesus, and we would love for you to come alongside us and the association and this church and other churches in the valley as we come alongside America and lifting up our leaders and lifting up anybody who needs Jesus. And next, we've got our children's ministry. We're starting that back up on the 8th of August. The first through sixth grade groups are going to be starting back in full swing on the 8th of August. So we're so thankful for all the help that has come along in volunteering and uh, giving alongside that uh, through VBS and all those things that have just led to an accumulation and a finality of starting fully back into full swing with those classes. So look out for that and make sure everybody knows about that. So our next one here, we've got our men's and women's event uh, coming on the 7th of August. So that's going to be our man up and all things beautiful for um, men's and women's ministries respectively. The men meet here in this room while the women meet in the uh, building one there in the front, and we all just gather together, fellowship, worship, and there's a message brought that morning just to, grit, just to continue the fellowship between men and women and uh, teach both men and women how to be the spiritual leaders of their families and just continue to equip them. And uh, we really value that here at South Peoria, so if you haven't been to one yet, please go. They're so awesome and so fun, so please um, just get involved with that. Perfect. We got our next one here is our Stump the Parents and uh, sermon topic today. Why did God judge Sodom and Gomorrah? And our sermon topic is fire from heaven. So this is a pretty tough topic today, and we hope that you grab the notes and stay plugged in as we are going through the sermon today, and that you just follow along the passage, fill in those notes. And we, our desire for you is really to hear God's working through you and hear God speaking to you and just write that down. Because we love for you guys to uh, go into life groups and work through all that that you've learned or all that you're going through, or all that um, the passage is teaching and speaking to you. So we Really hope that you would love to get involved in that way. And then finally, I think that's them all. That is everything. Perfect. So right now, we're going to go ahead and pray for the service. If you guys would rise with me and prepare our hearts for worship. Lord God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the breath in our lungs, the clothes on our backs, Lord, and the roof over our heads. As we gather together for worship today, Father, we... Just ask that you would lead and guide us today as we hear about your word, as the word is brought, Lord, as the message is preached. Please speak to us, Lord, because we need you. We depend on you, God, every single day. Help us to hear your voice, God, and help us to live and love practically, Lord, in light of your scripture. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for all that we have and the ability that we have to come here to worship, Lord, to gather and Lord, we just love you and we love to be in your presence. We pray this all in your heavenly and holy name. Amen. Good morning, church. This morning I want to bring to you 1 Thessalonians 1.8. The Lord's message rang out from you. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. And what this brings up in my mind is our mission statement real people who live to lead others to find life in Christ. 
and what a joy it is to shout the gospel and God's love to the world. Amen. Join us as we worship this morning. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'm not ashamed his name to bear. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. I'll take him with me anywhere. I'll tell the world how Jesus saved me and how he gave me a life brand new. Think of my blessed Redeemer. That's where we're going to start. Yep. Good morning, everyone. It's okay if we mess it up sometimes, didn't it? Amen. Amen. We still know we're redeemed. Amen. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Boy, are we blessed. Um, I'm going to ask right now that the men come forward. And uh, while they are, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Jim Wellman. You probably already know me, but uh, I'm one of the elders here, and we deal with uh, the spiritual needs in the church as elders. And uh, we're coming forward this morning as men to ask God's blessing on us, to help us to lead our homes and to make us men of God. Just draw us close to himself that we might be the men of God that he wants us to be. Amen, men? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this blessedness. Lord, we are redeemed by the blood of your Son. 
redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We are so blessed, Lord. You just walk with us each day, and you, you direct us and guide us as we yield ourselves to your Spirit. We pray that you would move within these men, Lord, within me. And Lord, that we might be men of God who walk forward, who lift our heads high, who praise your holy name, who remember that we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And Lord, today you are the great I am. You are the lily of the valley and the bright and morning star. You are the one that we kneel before today. You are the one that we love. And Lord, because you first loved us. And we thank you for your great love today. And I pray for each man standing here today, Lord, that you would just use them mightily in your kingdom's work. Where they have a chance to share their faith, may they step out and do so. And may your spirit guide them. Lord, where they need to make decisions in the home and to lead their homes, Lord, and to love their wives and children more, their grandchildren, Lord, that you would help them to do that with the love of Jesus. And Lord, we just give you thanks for this blessed day. We pray your blessings on these men, and we pray that you'd use them mightily, for we are truly desirous, Lord, of worshiping and serving you. And so, Lord, go with us and give us the strength that you gave those in the Old Testament and the New Testament and use us, Lord. And help us to remember, Lord, that nothing is impossible with God. So we give you praise as the men of God this morning and the ladies of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. As the men make their way back to the seat, their seats, will you please stand and join us as we continue to worship this morning? Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We for the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the Good morning, church. God is good. Amen. And all the time? Amen. Well, I'm going to ask that you will turn your Bibles open, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 19 as we continue in our study through Genesis. And I'm excited as we close out the month of July today with this chapter 19 in Genesis. In the month of August, we will actually be taking a break from the book of Genesis. We'll come right back to it in September. But for the month of August, we're actually going to be starting a new series on how to be a Christian in a post-Christian world. How should Christians live their lives in a post-Christian world? With the subtitle being, The Struggle is Real, isn't it? And today's passage actually sets us up for that, that series coming next week. But uh, before we read this passage today, in chapter 19, this week I sent out an email. I hope you got that email uh, message this week to be praying for today. And if you uh, have the app, it went out as a notification on the app as well. And many of you read it there on the app. And I encourage you, if you haven't downloaded the church app, download that today. You can go to your Apple 
uh, store or your Apple um, App Store or your Google Play Store, whatever kind of phone you have, and just search for South Peoria Baptist Church, and our app will pop right up. Download it and set up your profile on there, and we send messages out. You can tithe. You can be connected with your life group. You can follow along, watch our sermons online through the app. You can take notes online through the app. And there's all kinds of things, but we stay in communication through the app, so I encourage you to do that. But the purpose of the message that I sent out this week was to encourage you and your family to read through this chapter, chapter 19, and prayerfully be preparing for today. You see, I said in this, if you got the message, it asked the question, is God's word rated R? Is the Bible rated R? And the answer to that question is yes. God's word, the Bible, is not a rated G book. It's not even a rated PG-13 book. It deals with the sin of mankind, our total depravity and all that we are, which means in those sinful things, it deals with rated R issues, adult issues, and sometimes even beyond rated R issues in God's word. And 10 years ago, if you were to ask me if we should have kids in this room today as we work through chapter 19, I would have probably said no. And I don't know if that was from hopefulness or naivety, But in the reality of what's going on in chapter 19 with the adult issues that are being handled in chapter 19, our world no longer sees our children as something that needs to be protected from adult issues. And whether we realize it or not, while we look at what's going on in chapter 19 of Genesis, our world is inundating our kids down to the youngest levels about sexuality, about gender, about things that are adult issues, but they are inundating them and they're ramming it down their throats from a worldview. And so now I stand in kind of in opposition to myself from 10 years ago. But I want us to understand, I'm so thankful that we have a church that's focused on building up the family. We pray for men to be the righteous leaders of their family. We pray for mothers to be righteous leaders in their family. And we make it a priority for us to come and worship together. We are a church where kids sit next to their parents, their moms, and their dads, their grandmas, and their grandpas in church. And that is a really good thing. Because as we preach through God's word, and we're going to preach the whole thing, counsel of God's word. We're not going to shy away from the things in this word that may be difficult for us to handle or things we may even want to be avoiding with conversation with our kids because we may get uncomfortable in those conversations. But it's with prayer, with wisdom and discernment we want to approach this as well. And so today I stand in opposition of where I stood 10 years ago of that hopeful young man who thought that our kids were too young to deal with issues like this. But the reality of it is today In the world that we live in, our kids, from the very youngest of ages, on Disney Channel, on Nickelodeon, they're being inundated with these things. We'll go home today, and you turn on the Olympics, and the commercials will inundate your children, the NFL commercials, the NBA commercials, even the things that we have counted on for years to be a wholesome, entertaining, and educational foundation for our kids are ramming these things down their throats, even things like Sesame Street, has brought in Pride Month and is issuing, shoving that down our children's throat, presenting to our young kids, today's episode is brought to you by the letter Q and the number one, and supporting that by showing same-sex parents and non-binary gender-neutral puppets. And so today, it's with great prayer, great discernment that I ask you, we want to make sure we do what's right by your family. And so I hope that you've come into today prepared for today. I hope my prayer for today is that as we work through chapter 19, it causes you to take this home and have discussions that may have been avoided before today. Because if we do not educate our children on what God's word says about these subjects, the world is going to educate our children, and they already are, and it is going to be an anti-biblical and an anti-God education. And so I'm going to ask, will you stand with me as we read chapter 19, as we deal with these adult issues? I will do my best to keep it family appropriate today, but we are going to go to God's word, and we are going to exalt our Savior and our Creator today. So let's read this together. Chapter 19, verse 1. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, 
Please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered. We will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread with yeast, and they ate it. And before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them, but don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of our way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner. Now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. Verse 10, but the men reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were there at the door of the house, young and old with blindness, so that they could not find the door. The two men said to Lot, do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here because we are going to destroy this place. And the outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-laws, who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry and get out of this place, because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-laws thought he was joking. With the coming of the dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they brought them out, one of them said, flee your lives, don't look back, and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, no, my lords, please, your servant has found favor in your eyes and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life, but I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me and I'll die. Look, here is a town near enough to run to, and it is small. Let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. He said to them, very well, I will grant this request to you. I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but I flee there quickly because I can't, but flee there quickly because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That is why the town was called Zor. By the time Lot reached Zor, the sun had had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come into your presence today as your people, sinners saved by your grace. A desire to know you correctly according to your word, a desire to worship you and exalt our Savior who has paid the price for our sins, a desire for us to live a life worthy of the calling we have received, to walk with you. And Lord, as we read your word, you have given it to us as a gift so that we can know you correctly according to it. And so, Lord, I pray today for our minds and our hearts to be enlightened by your Spirit as we read through these words today. God, teach us to trust you, to know you, and to share your gospel with the world that needs the hope that we have. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as this passage begins, 
We pick up in Genesis chapter 19. Preston preached for us last week through the rest of Genesis chapter 18. And we pick up in the middle of this amazing narrative in Scripture where God has come and he sat down with Abraham and he's had a meal with him and he's established Abraham's place at the Lord's table. And here at this table, he's invited to him. He's shown his faithfulness. You belong to me, Abraham. You are a child of faith. I have called you. I have justified. And I have made you righteous in my eyes. You belong to me, and I will be faithful to you. And then after that dinner, dinner he gets up in the midst of this. It's shown in stark, dark contrast to who Abraham is, how the righteousness and justice of God flows, and who he is in contrast to the sinful depravity of the world that cries out for destruction. This plays out in my mind as an epic movie scene, a masterful storytelling. When you envision in your mind what's actually happening here, the Lord of creation, a sovereign God, the Almighty, is sitting down with Abraham as a friend. Then he stands him up, and he's there with two other angels, and they walk with Abraham. They take him for a walk in the cool of the evening. He literally walked with God as a friend like Enoch did. And on this journey, this walk has a very, very specific purpose. The purpose of this walk is for Abraham to know God better, to understand God better, to become even more intimate as a friend with the Lord. And God says, Abraham, I, this walk is for a purpose, for I have called you out, and this purpose is this, to reveal to Abraham the righteousness and justice of God. And why? Because the purpose of Abraham's life, Abraham has been chosen and called to be the father of faith that will teach righteousness and justice to his children, to his household, to the people of the generations that are to come, to every nation he will be a blessing because he will be the example that is teaching what righteousness and justice is, how to walk with the Lord. It is an example for us today. He did this with this prime purpose in Abraham's life to show us the righteousness and justice of God. And Abraham has been given the explicit responsibility to live his life and to teach that. Last week, Preston talked about this, the righteousness of God. What is it for us to be right? How do we live a righteous life? We live our life according to the will of God. When our life aligns with God's will, that's what righteous is. Justice is when we make judgments based on the will of God. And that's what righteous, walking with the Lord according to his will, justice, making our judgments based on his will. And as they're walking in the cool of the evening, their walk comes to the end on a mountain lookout over the sea, the Dead Sea. Beautiful. They're on the western side of the sea, the sun setting behind God and behind Abraham. And they look out across that sea and across the sea on the other side in this very fertile valley of the plains. The lights begin to twinkle in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God tells Abraham, I've come to judge them. And here in this moment, Abraham begins to wrestle with what God is saying. I'm going to destroy them for their sinfulness. Their sinfulness has been heard. The outcries are overwhelming. And here we see as, as Abraham begins to try and reconcile what God is saying with this God of love who has called him out, a God of love and a God of justice, and trying to figure this out, he petitions God. He comes and he intercedes. As he looks down at the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, he is fully aware of their wickedness. And yet he loves them. In that city is his nephew Lot and his family. In that city are the families that he had rescued not many years earlier from the hands of the kings from the east. He had traveled back. He had got to know them. They were appreciative to Abraham. And here Abraham, as the sun is setting, begins to negotiate with God. If you have 50 people, and Preston covered that last week, you know the story. And finally works him down to 10 and says, if there's 10 righteous people, God says, if there's 10, I will not destroy it. And God leaves Abraham there. The two angels walk away. And Abraham's left as the sun's setting, looking at these cities, hoping there's someone of righteousness there. And he walks back to his tent as the sun is setting. 
And what's going on here, for you and for me, as we wrestle with the justice and the righteousness of God, Abraham comes to this point, will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Abraham asked God that. Won't you do what is right, God? And the answer to that question is always yes, because he is righteous and he is just. Whatever God does, it is right. It is righteous, it is just. And here, the point of this story is we look out at what's going on here. And I want you to write this down in your notes today. God's judgment on Sodom was a warning for Israel. And for us today to not become like him, like them. Listen, this, this is amazing to me, the, the power of this narrative. It was a warning to Israel. What's actually happening in this? If we, fla- if we flash forward 500 years, Abraham has, ri- Ab- Abraham has lived this, but Moses is the one who wrote it down almost 500 years in the future. He is writing the book of Genesis down as God is revealing it to him. They know the stories. It's been passed down from generation to generation, and for the first time, it is written down in one complete narrative. The first five books of the Old Testament written by Moses. The people that Abraham, his descendants, the Israelites, are standing on the banks of the Jordan River. They're getting ready to go back into the promised land. They have been in oppression. They have been in captivity for 400 years, as God had told Abraham his descendants would be. The 40 more years they wandered in the desert because they, weren't, they were disobedient to the Lord. And now, for the very first time, Moses is standing in front of all of Israel, and he's reading out loud the story of Abraham, the book of Genesis. And Israel is listening with great intent because God is revealing to them the types of people and the depth of sin they are about to encounter in the land of Canaan as they return to the promised land. And here's the ultimate warning as he's telling them to go into the promised land. Do not become like them. Do not become like them. And that is our warning here today for us as well. He is warning all of us, do not become like the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. It tells us that in the New Testament. In Jude, verse 7, it says, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Echoing all through scripture, do not become like them. For if we become like them, fire not only will rain down from heaven, but we will be the subject of eternal fire. As as Moses, flashing back 500 years back to Abraham, as Moses said that, Abraham stood looking out. Abraham was fully aware of the sinfulness of Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, we look back just a couple of verses in the last chapter. In chapter 18, it says, Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin is so grievous, that I will go down and see what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. This conversation, listen, we know God is sovereign. He doesn't need to go down. This is the same thing that happened at the Tower of Babel. God doesn't have to come down from heaven to see how evil the people are. He knows. But this conversation is for the benefit of Abraham. God has shown up and says, Abraham, I'm going to go see how evil they are. And Abraham knows in his heart and his mind, he has seen it firsthand, how grievous their sin is. And as he walks back to his tent, he has no doubt in his mind. What will begin to echo on our minds through the Old Testament, through Romans chapter 3, there are none righteous, no, not one. Their mouths are open graves. And he goes back and goes to sleep. But as soon as those angels walk away from Abraham, supernaturally, they're angels of heaven, 
There is no travel time for them. Immediately they arrive as the sun is setting. Meanwhile, across the sea, they arrive as the sun is setting at the gates of Sodom and Gomorrah. And there Lot is sitting with them. And Lot realizes as they are walking up to the city that he realizes exactly what Abraham realized when they walked up to Abraham's camp, that these are are something other than this world. These two men walking up are not actually men, but they are some kind of heavenly creatures. And Lot runs out to meet them face to face, and he bows down before them. And here is why Lot does that. It's because in stark contrast to the camp of Abraham where God is welcomed, Lot knows the sin of the city of Sodom. And he knows that these men sent from God will not only not be welcomed in Sodom, but the city of Sodom will be hostile towards them, violent towards them, and is dangerous for them. So he runs out and he cuts them off and says, come to my house, come to my house. And he's trying to stand as a gatekeeper between the city of Sodom and these men. And he's trying to keep apart these two worlds that are about to clash, a world of wickedness, the world of wicked men, and the world of heavenly angels and of God coming to be. And he doesn't want them to encounter what happens inside the gates of Sodom. And they refuse. No, we're not going to go. We're going to go spend the night in the middle of town at the square. We need to see what's happening in town. And, and Lot pushes back. It actually means to press forcefully. No, you need to come to my house. And so he presses back against them, and they say, fine, we'll go to your house. And so he goes to the house with these men, locks the doors behind him, quickly makes a dinner for them, and before they go to sleep, the sun has just set. Darkness has fallen on the town of Sodom. Now, we need to understand this. Preston talked about this last week and did a fantastic job. The sin of Sodom, the spectrum was full. If you could imagine evil and wicked, it was happening in the town of Sodom. Abuse of children, slavery, Trafficking, addictions, violence, murder. This was not something that was discouraged. This was the way of life. But ultimately what we find in the story of Sodom is this. As the grievous sins of that city cried out to God, Abraham understood it. Lot knew the grievous sins. And the grievous depth of their sin was measured by the complete sexual immorality of the whole city. I'm going to say that again. The depth, the grievous depth of their sin was measured by the complete sexual immorality of the whole city. Verse 4 says this. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. What's going on in the city of Sodom? Sexual immorality has become the measure, measure of the depravity, of the grievous depth of the sin of the whole city, of their whole culture, of their whole society. The stark contrast, the only one who would not participate in this was Lot, who was inside the house with these men. And in this passage, in chapter 19, we deal with all kinds of sexual immorality. Homosexuality. There's actually no biblical word for homosexuality. It's actually called sodomy. It's called sodomy because it's named after the town of Sodom. And someone who practices homosexuality, homosexuality, the biblical term for that is sodomite. But not only that, we need to realize sexual immorality does not just flow one way. It also covers in this chapter incest. It also covers in this chapter adultery. It also fornication, which is marriage out, or, or sex before marriage. Adultery is sex outside the bounds of marriage. 
and, and as we look at all the different types of sexual sin that is being highlighted in this passage, this is the full measure of the depravity of mankind. We need to understand as we look at our culture today, as that warning rings out, do not become like them. Why? Because there's two things we need to realize about sexual sin, I believe, today. God's word is inundated with warnings against it. Number one is this. Sexual sin is unique in destruction. Why? Because it damages and scars down to the soul. Sexual sin is different than any other kind of sin. Why? Because the damage it causes scars all the way down to your soul. You and I, every man, woman, and child are created in the image of God. One of the ways that we are created in the image of God is the fact that we are both body and spirit. And yet that body and that soul is, is connected fully to one another. While I can't put my hands on your soul, we know what our body is. They are intimately and they, short of death on this earth, your body and your soul cannot be separated. What we see in, in, Corinthian, in 1 Corinthians, which deals a lot with sexual sin, is this. It says, flee from sexual immorality. Why? Because all other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually, that's any kinds of those sins, adultery, fornication, incest, rape, all those things are happening, homosexuality, all those things are wrapped up in what's happening in the town of Sodom. Anybody who, create, who commits sexual sin sins against their own body. It damages our body and it translates that damage deep down to your soul. How do we know that continues? Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Your bodies are connected directly to your soul. Your soul is the place the Holy Spirit indwells inside of you. And it is the place that if you commit sexual sin of any kind, it scars and damages, it twists, twists and hurts your soul. In this room today and watching online are people who have had sexual sin committed against them. Not only does it hurt the person who commits the sin, you know what it is to bear the marks of sexual sin on your soul. One of the things of people, of children or adults who have been raped or incest, one of the things that they try to do, one of the default mechanisms the defense goes on is they will spend hours and hours and hours in the shower. Why? Because they're trying to wash off the hurt and the pain, the suffering, but no matter how much water they wash with, it doesn't touch the soul. Sexual sin is different. And it will scar and mar and twist our soul. But the other thing that makes sexual sin is different, we need to realize this, sexual sin is unique. Number two, in its absolute and complete rejection of God. We have to understand, sexual sin is different. It's unique. Damages down to our soul but it is also an absolute and complete rejection of God. And for us to understand that, such a beautiful picture in Genesis. We go back to the beginning. Jesus, God of creation, speaking creation to being on day six, he creates from the dust of the ground a man named Adam. He creates Adam in his own image in the image of God he creates him he takes him before all the animals to show him Adam there's no helper for you the one I'm going to make for you is special he puts Adam to sleep and takes a rib from Adam's side and in the order of God he creates a woman created in the image of God male and female he created them in the image of God he created them and he brought them together and he united them one in flesh because our bodies and our souls were connected in such a way that when we are intimate with somebody else we become one with them 
And as they become one, he commits them. He says, for this reason, a man shall leave his mother and his father and shall cleave to his wife, for they are one. And then he gives them the great command. God created Adam and Eve, man and woman, in his image for the great command to fill the earth with the image of God to be fruitful and multiply and spread out and let the glory of God be seen as the image of God reflects it throughout the whole earth. Any kind of sexual sin rejects completely the sovereignty of God. It rejects the authority of God. It rejects the order of God and says to our creator, You do not get to say who I am, what I do, or who I do it with. And while we are busy scarring and messing our souls up and other people's souls up, the ultimate uniqueness of this sin is that we have disobeyed the command of God in the order in which he has set. And God has a response to that. If you remember back when we were working through Romans, the very first chapter of Romans we spent a lot of time in. Romans tells us the wrath of God is being poured out from heaven right now because mankind has fully and completely rejected him. And what's it look like? Verse 24, chapter 1, puts it this way. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever to be praised, amen. Because of this, God gave them over to the shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for one another. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were aflamed with lust for one another. Men commended shameful acts with other men and received in themselves due penalty for their error in their body and in their soul. Sexual immorality and sin completely rejects God. And furthermore, what did it lead to? Just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death. They not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. And here in the midst of all of this, this is ripped right out of the daily times of Sodom. And it's ripped right out of the daily times, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Arizona Republic, and the Peoria Star. This sinful immorality of sexuality, sexual immorality leads to complete rejection of God, debauchery, and all kinds of all the other wickedness. And here we see God gives us over to it. But as we look at this, this is the sin of Sodom. We need to talk about the man Lot now, don't we? The sin's been made clear, what's going on in Sodom, but what's going on in the heart and the mind of Lot? This is so important for us to understand and wrap our minds around. In this Lot, when Lot se- or in this narrative, when Lot separated from Abraham, do you remember? This town wasn't big enough for the both of them. This fields weren't big enough for the both of them, and their people were fighting amongst each other. And Abraham says, you pick wherever you want to go. Lot looks towards the fertile plains of Sodom sees comfort and luxury there and says, I will go there. And he, he pops his tents, pitches his tents in the plains of Sodom. The next time we see Lot, he's living inside of Sodom. He's moved out of his tents into more comfortable, luxurious settings. And in this narrative, we see that Lot has now fully assimilated into Sodom. He's assimilated into their culture, into their society, and is now 
part of the leadership, sitting at the gates. That's where they sit together, the leaders of the city. Lot, a righteous man, has now fully become integrated. He was attracted to the things of this world. And here's the thing with Lot. Lot thought he could live on the fence of righteous living for God and living for the desi- and the desires for this world. And he remained silent while the world around him was on fire in sin and destruction. It raged around him. And as, mu- as much as Lot worked his way into the culture and society of Sodom, what we learn in this context is Sodom had just as much worked its way into the heart and the mind of Lot. And in this, we see a lot that's probably a lot like us today. Actually, that pro- we probably need to rephrase that. We need to probably rephrase that. It, you see, because Lot is the prototype for what we would call the Christian hypocrite. It's probably more accurate to say it this way. I, myself, me, and maybe you are more like Lot than we're willing to admit or realize. We're a lot more like Lot than we want to come to terms with. We think we could live on the fence of righteousness for God and embracing the things of this world. See, Lot's the type of guy who would be just like Pastor Jeremiah or like you in ways to where he would go home tonight and he would watch the same debauchery on TV as everybody else in Sodom. He would listen to the same debauched music and poison his mind as everybody else in Sodom. He would laugh at the same jokes. He would take advantage of the same business deals. He would take advantage of the same oppression as everyone else in Sodom. And Lot in his own mind was able to justify this by having a list of certain things that he depicted as ultimate evils that he would not participate in. He would not participate in the sodomy of Sodom. He would not participate in the sexual immorality of Sodom. And in his mind, he was somehow able, by not doing certain things, able to manage or balance in his mind the fact that he was a righteous man trying to follow God, and yet he desired the things of the world more than he desired God. And we find here this hypocritical charade. And here is the ultimate thing in this. You guys, this is is what's so crazy about this, is it works. It worked for Lot. The charade worked for Lot. It works for me. And it will work for you too. Until God shows up at the gate. See, the only people we fool are ourselves. And when God shows up at the gate, that hypocritical charade falls apart at the seams. And we realize who we truly are. And here's where Lot's at. In the midst of what's going on, in what's happening in his life, he's trying to figure out, what do I do now. And so he does what only he can figure out, what the only thing he can think of, and he steps outside to bring defense to these men. And this is what happens. Lot went outside in verse 6 to meet them. He shut the door behind him and said, no, my friends, do not do this wicked thing. All of a sudden, he grows a backbone. All, all of a sudden, he's not silent anymore. He grows a backbone, and he says, don't do this wicked thing. This is evil. These men are from the Lord. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. And I, here's the reality of it. It's on full display here. The charade falls apart when God shows up. Sodom had become so much a part of Lot, he couldn't even think correctly. The solution he presents to the sexual immorality of Sodom is an even more wicked sexual immorality. 
He's trying to figure it out. He's trying to dig himself out of the hole. And instead, he offers his own daughters up as a sacrifice. And even greater wickedness. All the dads in this room should be cringing at this, shouldn't we? We know. We pray for the men of our church every Sunday. Why? Because we realize we are more apt to bring destruction into our home than righteousness. God and the order that he created is that he created male and female in the image of God, equal in value, different in roles. And the role of the man is to become the spiritual leader of the home and lead his family in righteousness. But by our very own sinful nature, we're just like Lot and we will do way more destruction to our families. That's why we pray for our men every Sunday. Because apart from the grace of God at work in our lives, we will hurt and damage our families. Lot offers up his daughter. Second Peter says it this way about Lot, and it blows my mind. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawlessness, for the righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and he heard. Could you imagine? We are so desensitized by our culture and our society. The things that we celebrate on TV, from violence to murder to video games, the things, the sexual immorality, we are so desensitized. Lot heard things that he could only imagine was happening in the, in the houses in the square around him. He saw things that he had never saw before. He dealt with things and he was trying to process it. And all the time he was struggling. He was tormented by that sin. Why? Because he was righteous according to God, not by his own works. Saved. He belonged to the Lord, yet his, he desired the things of this world more to such an extent that he would rather live in Sodom. And every night when he laid his head on the pillow. He was a man who was torn apart by two different worlds and lives. The angel said, go get your son-in-laws. He goes out to them, and his hypocrisy is exposed even more. As he tries to convince his son-in-laws, he's never spoken up against the debauchery of sin. He's never spoken about the hope of Christ. He's never spoken about Yahweh, God who saves and is faithful. And now he goes out because the men have blinded these men around the house and they have now dispersed back to their homes. And he goes and finds the men who are, who are engaged to his daughters and says, come with us, God is going to destroy Sodom. And they say, get out of here, old man. You're drunk, you're funny, it's a joke. We don't know what you're talking about. The hypocrisy of the sin in Lot's life is exposed when he tries eventually to show them righteousness, and they go, who do you think you are? What are you talking about? Alan Ross, who has written a great commentary on the book of Genesis, says it this way. Hypocrisy was revealed by the visitation from on high. Those are the angels. As long as the Lord left him alone, he would hold to his faith but live in Sodom. I'm good with God as long as God stays in heaven and I stay down here. I can be faithful, just let me have the things of Sodom. But ultimately, he could not have both. Sodom would destroy him if the Lord did not destroy Sodom. And here his hypocrisy was exposed to the deepest level. He goes back to his house. The son-in-laws aren't coming. His wife's throwing a fit. His daughters don't want to go. And the angels have told him, the fire's coming. And Lot knows the fire's coming. Because what God says he'll do, he'll do. And Lot did not want to leave. He hesitated. And what that word hesitate literally means in Hebrew is to linger. And you know exactly what it is. We do this when it's time for a dentist appointment. I don't want to go to that. Doctor's appointment. I don't want to go to that. We wait till the last minute. I don't want to go. Why? Because we fear what's coming. We don't want the uncomfortable part of that. But that's not what's going on in Lot's life. Lot doesn't want to leave Sodom because he loves his sin. And the angels, it says they grab him by the hand. It literally means to seize and forcibly removed him. They forcibly removed him, his wife, and his two daughters from the city of Sodom. Why? It says, because God had mercy on him. And this is a beautiful picture, church. I want you to know this. If you're here today and you are in Christ, you have been saved, born again, brought from death to life, I don't know the details. I don't know the story of how it happened, but I do know 
how God did it. How did God save you? He did it the exact same way he saved Lot, by force. Why? Because we love our sin. And we are destined for fire from heaven to rain down as God's righteous judgment pours out. But because he has mercy on us, he grabs a hold of us and makes us his own. Because you and I would never get out of our sin by our own will. We would never leave it behind because there is no one who seeks God. There's no one's righteous, not one. Your story and my story is seen in this beautiful sentence of God grabbing a hold and seizing Lot. Lot did not deserve it. He didn't earn it. He should have earned and deserved burning right there with everybody else. But God removed him by grace, mercy. And Lot, even admits to this, God, you've shown me so much grace. You've shown me so much mercy. But listen, They say, flee to the hills right now because it's going to rain down. And Lot says, you've shown me so much mercy. You've shown me so much kindness. But if I lose what I love, I will die. There's a little town just a little bit further down the road. Let me have just a little Sodom. Let me have just a little bit of the things that I love. Let me just go there. If I go to where you're commanding me to go, surely I will die. I will lose everything I love. And Lot's not talking about his wife. He's not talking about his daughters. He's talking about his sinful desires. I can't imagine not having the things that I desire. An amazing mercy and grace, God, still. Okay, go to this little town called Zor. The little Sodom literally says in there, and that town's called, that's why it's called Zor, is because it means little itty-bitty. And Lot said, let me have just a little bit of my sin. I can't live without it. And they rush to Zor. The angel says, get there fast, because I can't destroy the cities until you're in Zor. And so they get to Zor, and then we see his wife looks back and turns to a pillar of salt. This isn't, in my mind as a kid, I always imagined this, like she looks over her shoulder and just like turns into like, I don't know, a salt shaker or something. I don't know. But that's not what happens here. See, what's going on is Lot failed to lead his family in righteousness. While he was made righteous and had faith in God, nobody else in his family did. We see that later in the end of this chapter. We see that in his daughters. They're sodomites through and through. And in their sexual immorality and their sin actually give birth to two of the greatest enemies of Israel and the greatest thorns in their side when they go to take the promised land again. But his wife, was fully sodomite. And she loved Sodom just as much, even more than Lot did. She never made it to Zor. As Lot lingered and was forcibly moved out of the city, his wife was too. She didn't want to leave. She drug her feet. She didn't ever make it out of the plains. And when God rained fire down, sulfur on fire from heaven, she was killed along with everyone else, but her body was encased in that sulfur. Salt a monument for anyone who would pass that way. What happens to those who love their sin more than they would be willing to follow God? And we find here in the midst of all of this, this amazing, there's this truth here. It said Lot was tormented by his sin in many ways, seeing the things happening around him, trying to reconcile it, trying to deal with the sin in his own life. But here's a truth in the middle of all this, and we need to realize this truth. The most tormented people, and write this down, the most tormented people on earth are believers that live in sin and affirm sin. Lot's life was full of destruction. He's looking around. He can't figure out why. He's living in the midst of this wickedness, and he's not speaking up. And in his silence, he's affirming it and letting it happen. And he can't figure out why his kids don't love the Lord. He can't figure out why his wife doesn't love the Lord. He can't figure out why there's destruction in his family. His whole world's falling apart. Why? Because the most tormented people on earth are believers who live in sin and affirm it. That's not freedom. That's slavery. We're slaves to sin. And in this amazing narrative of pictures, Lot escapes and Zor, 
and fire begins to rain down. The sun is rising, and this is how the story ends here. Abraham wakes up. He walks back up that mountain. He stands at the lookout and looks out over the sea to the other side and sees the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are now nothing but a dense smoke, flattens. Even today they are now, where they once stood has now been totally destroyed, all the vegetation, and is actually the sea swallowed them up. They are underwater today. And Moses was affirmed as he stood there, probably in the wind, looking out, wondering what happened to Lot, wondering what's going on, knowing the night before there was not one righteous. He looks out and he fully understands God's righteousness and his justice. And the judge of all the earth will do what is right. But that's not the end. It's kind of like a Marvel superhero movie. There's a tagline after the credits here. And a statement of great hope and joy for all of us. A mercy. What happened? He's wondering what happened to his nephew Lot. And this is the great hope. And this is how it is. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. Why did God save Lot? Because Abraham interceded. Abraham asked him to. And here's the great hope for you and for me as we look out at our families, our friends, our co-workers in this world, as far as they may be from God, as far as they may be and reject God fully, no one is too far from the grace of God. And Abraham who loved his nephew Lot, prayed for God to save his nephew Lot. And it says, God remembered Abraham. And do you remember when we work through what it says, when God remembers somebody, it's not that he had forgotten or it comes to mind, it's that he moves toward doing what he had promised he would do. And he saves Abraham. And here's one of the greatest promises that we can hold to in the midst of this. We all deserve the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. But as long as there is breath in the lungs, there is hope for salvation in the Lord. And here is where it comes. When we intercede for those we love, God's salvation was brought to Lot. It was always his plan to save Lot. But the means of his plan was going to be through the prayers of Abraham. And it's the same for your family too. God will save your family through answering your prayers. He'll save your friends if you truly want them to know But here's what we need to learn in all of this. How does this apply to our lives today? Quickly, this is what we need to realize. If this is true, that God has given us Sodom and Gomorrah as a warning not to become like them, if the God, the judge of all the earth, will do what is right, then one of the main things we need to realize as Christians is this. When our culture, write this down, when our culture normalizes sexual sin and denies God's order, we are on the verge of destruction. When our culture normalizes sexual sin and denies God's order, we are on the verge of destruction. Listen, Christian, please, if you're online, if you're in this room, listen to me closely. This is so important. Listen. Listen. The world is sharing a false gospel. And they're even using the name Jesus. And the New Testament is full of warnings of the doctrines of demons that are coming to rob this world of the true gospel and the true hope. Listen, this is so important for you to understand and for us as Christians to understand. They have presented a false gospel in the name of Jesus, and this is what it sounds like. Maybe you've heard it, and maybe you've bought into this. That Jesus is a God of love. He just loves people, and the only answer is just to love somebody. And this is the false gospel of what the world is presenting and calling it tolerance and relabeling what love truly is. But listen, Christian, this is so important. They're relabeling these sins, and they're calling them things like human rights. They're calling them things like activism. 
They're calling them things like pride month. They're calling them things that make us think this, if Jesus loved, then we have to just love. And they are twisting the truth of the gospel into something that is distorted and is not right, which makes it no gospel at all. There is no hope at all. And as Christians, we get wrapped up in a politically correct culture and we're afraid to offend people. We're afraid to speak truth. We're afraid to share the gospel because of what the world is going to do or how we're going to be viewed or how, how it's wrong or how somebody's feelings may be hurt. But listen, listen, this is so important. Maybe you've gotten wrapped up in it. Maybe you've participated in activism or pushing for these human rights that we realize human rights come from one place, the creator, and he determines what our rights are. But here's the truth. Listen. It is not, write this down, it is not loving to remain silent or affirm sin. Our world right now is twisting love and saying it is to accept sin. That's what love is. To accept sin is what love is. That we can't say that somebody who's confused about their gender or has no gender or is trans something or claims to be something or or their sexuality or whether it's even all these sins are sexual from homosexuality to gender issues to their identity to pronouns to homosexuality to, to adultery to fornication abortion. These are all sexual sins, and Christians are lining up in activism and lining up in a false gospel that is being called this this tolerance of love. And listen, it is not loving to remain silent or affirm sin. Why? Because Christian, if you believe God's word, if you believe Sodom and Gomorrah is an example for us, a warning for us not to become like them, If you believe the righteous God of creation is holy and just and will pour out his wrath on the ungodly, on the sinners of this world. If you truly believe God's word, if you truly know God, it is not loving to remain silent or affirm the sin of this world. At best, it's hypocritical. At worst, It's condemning people to hell and telling them, even though they're sinners, they don't need to be saved. They don't need God. You drive drive just a couple of miles in any direction right now. Pick a direction. North or south, east or west, from where you sit right now. Probably if you're watching online, where you sit there as well. Even within a mile where we are right now, you will find churches who pride themselves in being affirming. Those churches don't belong to the Lord. Those are temples of darkness that are condemning people to hell because it is not loving to affirm sin and remain silent. This is what loving is. In fact, before we even say that, 2 Peter puts it this way. Listen. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being. How? God said, let there be light. He spoke creation into being by his word. And the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters, also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. That's the sin of destruction that God brought down on the sin of Noah. He destroyed the world by his word in the flood. And yet, this verse 7 right here, church, if you believe God's word, it is not loving to remain silent or or affirm sin. Why? Because by the same word, the word of God that created us, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of the judgment and destruction of the ungodly. It's coming. If we truly understand, when we get to a place where we normalize sexual immorality and sexual sin as they did in Sodom. We are on the verge of destruction as a world. This is what love is. Write this down. Love is speaking out against sin with the hope of the gospel. There's only one answer. There's only one hope. If we keep it to ourselves, that's not love. At best, it's hypocrisy. At worst, it's condemning people to hell. True love is being willing to stand in righteousness as God showed Abraham, this is what you need to teach the world. 
You're going to bless the nations by showing them how to walk in righteousness. True love is for us, the church, the bride of Christ, to stand up. We are not as far gone as Sodom and Gomorrah is, as bad as this world is, as bad off as our nation is right now. Church, we are not as far gone as we think we are. Why? Because there are still righteous people who are willing to stand up and show love and share the gospel with people who need to know Jesus Christ. But you need to also know this. Write this down. The world will attack you and hate you for loving them. You'll be seen as a bigot. They'll hate you. If you tell them that they're a sinner, if you speak truth and you speak in love, not in hate, church, we never hate. We speak it in love because our hearts are broken, because we can smell the embers of heaven beginning to warm up. The sulfur is beginning to fill the air. And the more our world goes in a way of normalizing the sexual sin and immorality of this world, the embers of heaven are about to fall again. This world has been set aside for that. But for all who are in Christ, that is not their destination or their reality. And our hearts are broken. Why? Because Paul told us, we too were once like them, weren't we? And we were sinners saved by grace. God reached in just like he did with Lot and pulled us out of this world that was destined for hell, destined for hellfire. And here today we see even now our calling is at all costs to share the gospel, to be real people who will speak up against sin and righteousness with the hope of the gospel so that people can find life in Christ. 1 Peter 4, 4 says, though, but they are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. It's what they did to Lot when he finally stepped up. They said, who are you? Who do you think you are? You're a foreigner in our land. You don't belong here. Lot never belonged to Sodom as much as he tried to. They would never accept him as that. And they attacked him. But as we share the gospel of Christ that brings salvation and hope for all, this is one of the greatest hopes, and I want you to write this down as we close. If I belong to the Lord, my sin is not my identity. I am a child of God. This is the hope, and this is the prayer. Our world, in the midst of the sexual immorality that we face, they are lost and they're trying to find their identity apart from God and the only place they have to find it is their sin. So they identify as their sin. That's why you see the mix up with pronouns right now. It's not affirming to, show, to call somebody by their preferred pronouns, church. That's not loving to affirm their sin. What's loving is to share with them the gospel of truth. Why? Because that identity will lead them to hell. But for those who belong to Christ, our identity is found as children of God. And so if you're here today, I want to encourage you, watching online, if you're trying to find your identity in anything else other than belonging to the Lord and being a child of God, give your life to Christ today. And if you're a Christian here today, stand firm in your understanding of God's word. Stand firm in the truth of this knowledge. Do not affirm sin. Do not remain silent. But church, as a light, as the ambassadors of Christ, speak truth and love and share the hope of the gospel with the world that is lost without it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. In the midst of the world around us, our world's on fire, destruction's everywhere. They don't even recognize it. They can't even smell the embers. And God, even now as we see your mercy rains down, we can hear the beautiful sound of your rain even on this building. Your mercy is so good. You are faithful. You, you water the earth. You call us out. God, right now there is a world that is lost and they're trying to find their identity apart from you. If anyone is here, God, and has not given their life to follow you, is not finding their identity as a child of God to try and live in the righteousness of following you, God, I pray today becomes a day of salvation. That they call on the name of the Lord. God, today is a day that they commit their life to you, to live for Lord, for you. God, I pray for us as a church. This is the truth of your word. It doesn't matter what the world says. Your word teaches us our identity is found in you. Sexual immorality of all kinds leads to destruction. 
And we cannot call good evil. And we cannot call evil good. That is not loving. If we remain silent, God, we are, we are being a part of the sin. We are condoning that sin. We are being complicit in the sin of this world. We are being complicit in people going to hell. And that's not what you've called us to do. You've called us in love to share the gospel. So God, make us a church that cherishes our salvation so much that we live to lead others to find that same life we have in you. In your powerful name we pray, amen. Amen, church. Will you stand with us as we continue to worship our God this morning? Once again, you all may be seated. I can confidently confirm that it is, in fact, raining outside. So be ready for that when you leave today. <laughs> but one of the things that the great rain brings is not only life to the ground and, um, you know, watering the crops and whatnot. It is a great time for a nice hot cup of coffee. Amen. Is anybody like Starbucks? Starbucks drinkers around here? No? Okay. More of a black coffee pot with some sugar and cream, maybe. My uh, parents grew up drinking um, Circle K coffee. They, I don't know why they love Circle K coffee so much, but it was, it was so good to them. Um, the first time I had coffee was with my grandmother. She just served it black with two spoonsfuls of sugar, so that's how I learned to like coffee. And uh, I opened the world to so many great different coffees out there, but it was, it was good. But um, the reason why I share that story is because uh, Starbucks and coffee can teach us a little bit about giving, and I'd like to share that with you. And if any of you know, when Starbucks first started, they had a, um, the person who founded it, his name was Howard Scholes, and then he started it and then kind of handed off leadership to somebody else. And then the Starbucks we know today is, was formed by um, a lot of other people, including himself. Uh, but he had a, a decline, uh, or Starbucks itself had a decline in, um, in revenue and profit, and it was just kind of going downhill for a while. And they brought Howard Schultz back in, the original founder, to um, kind of pick the place back up, get it back up and running to the way it was. So when he came back, he gave a, he gave a speech and, and got it going again, but his, his speech included something super important that all of us can take away today. It had something to do, I don't have the exact quote with me, but it, the, the theme of the quote, and the, the spirit behind it was that it's not always one huge thing that takes down a company or, or leads you down a dark road or, you know, um, it's not just one giant thing always. It's a series of choices and it's a series of things that compound one after the other and build up after a while. 
And that was his, his statement about how Starbucks was going downhill, was that it wasn't just one big thing that made it go down under, it was a series of compromises of quality and service and uh, where they get their products and things like that that made it really go downhill. And that applies to us because it's not always one big thing that we give that makes us generous givers or develops that attitude of giving in us. It's not when, when youth ministry is going to summer camp and we give and that's the one time we give and then we're generous givers and that attitude's been built up. It's a series of strategic, consistent, and generous choices to give and small choices to give, starting with the tithe and it continues and compounds when you decide to give here and decide to give there and it just compounds and you, you develop this attitude of giving and generous giving at that where it becomes a practice, a habit of where I'm, I give because that's part of who I am now. That's what Christ has been developing in my heart. And my prayer for you is that you would all make small choices to be generous and small choices and consistent choices and faithful choices to be consistent to God. And that all of us together as a church family would develop that together and lift each other up in that. So would you join me in a word of prayer as we pray for this time of giving, as we pray for all the tithes and offerings that come in, not just this week, but in, in all this year, the whole, whenever they come in, whether they come in uh, in person here or online or through text or however you send it in or however you give, join me as we voice a word of prayer. Lord God, we are so humbled, Lord, and we're thankful, Lord, for your power and your might because you are Lord Almighty, God. You are the creator, Lord, and you sustain us. Father, do not delay in your sanctification, Lord. We know that it's oftentimes awkward and uncomfortable, Lord, but we need your hand in our lives to form us to be like your son, Lord. Help us to understand what your word says. We can read words on a page, Lord, but can we apply it in life? Can we love others how you loved us? Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the rain. We thank you, Lord, that, that we just have a building to come to, that we have a church family to go to, that we even have the clothes on our backs, Lord, and the food in our stomachs. We're so grateful, Lord. We humbly bow before your throne and we ask that you would bless us as we continue throughout our week, that you would continue to be with us, you would continue to work in us, Lord. And as we close out our service this morning, Father, that you would be praised and all glory would be yours. In your holy name, God, we pray. Amen. Church, will you stand with us and join us as we continue worshiping this morning? See bless you and keep you and may we be real people who live to lead others to find life in Christ and we'll see you next week church